Hello, and thank you for joining us today for our program entitled Navigating the Changing Landscape in the Judicial System, How Young Lawyers Can Thrive. My name is Tiffany Perry. I currently serve as the Young Lawyer Division's National Conference Team Director, and I will serve as your moderator today. We are fortunate enough to benefit from the knowledge and experience of a few trailblazers in our profession. Joining us today are Attorney Laura Farber, Chief Justice Nathan Heck, and also Judge Mark Brandon. For the sake of allowing time to ensure that you benefit most from our faculty's experience, I'm only going to highlight a few points from their bio. However, the links to their full bios will be placed in the chat box for your review. Attorney Laura Farber is a partner in the Pasadena law firm of Han & Han LLP, where she practices civil litigation with an emphasis in employment disputes and counsels clients in employment and a variety of other matters. Laura is a member of the American Bar Association, where she serves as the state delegate for California in the House of Delegates, and is also the co-chair of the coordinating group on Practice Forward a organization or excuse me, group that identifies challenges and opportunities within the legal profession post COVID. Attorney Farber is also a former member of the YLD where she served as a past chair and is also a past member of the ABA Journal Editorial Board. Next, we have Chief Justice Nathan Heck, who is the 27th Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Texas, the state of Texas. He is the longest serving member of the court in the Texas history and the longest tenured Texas judge in active service. He has been elected to the court seven times, first in 1988 as a justice and in 2014, and most recently in 2020 as chief justice. His current term ends December 31st, 2026. Chief Justice Heck has overseen revisions to the rules of administration, practice, and procedure in Texas courts, and was appointed by the Chief Justice of the United States to the Federal Advisory Committee on Civil Rules. He is active in the court's efforts to assure that Texans living below the poverty level, as well as others with limited means, have access to basic civil legal services. Lastly, he is the immediate past president of the National Conference of Chief Justices and a life member of the American Law Institute and a member of council. And finally, last but not least, Judge Mark Randon. He was appointed in 2014 as a US bankruptcy judge for the Eastern, Eastern District of Michigan by US Court of Appeals Chief Judge Alice M. Batchelder of the Sixth Circuit. Most notably, he became the youngest individual to be appointed as a state of Michigan district judge in February 2001 when he was appointed to Wayne County 36th District Court at the age of 32. At this time, I'd like to jump into our discussion. The legal spectrum is forever changing. Just recently, we've seen a big change in how courts operate due to the COVID-19 pandemic. However, before we get into that, I'd like to ask our faculty members to share their views on what they would say is or are currently the greatest problems facing the legal profession. And with that, I'll start with Attorney Farber. Well, thank you, and it's great to be with you. Um, appreciate this opportunity to always connect with the Young Lawyers Division and Young Lawyers. In terms of what I think uh, has happened and what is happening for the long term and short term of the legal profession, I think the challenges have to do with how we're going to stay uh, inclusive and how are we positioned to be as diverse and inclusive in the long term. And I say that because the pandemic, I think, has exacerbated certain things for certain folks. And I think we've had two pandemics, by the way. I'm not just focused on the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm also talking about the racial and social justice pandemic. And so I think 
There have been some challenges, especially for women uh, and, and parents of young children during all of this process, which has brought to the forefront how, you know, how are we doing things in the legal profession? What kind of demands are we making? What are we expecting? And how are we making those demands um, or how are we achieving as lawyers and participants in the legal profession in that regard, how are we achieving the ability to stay active, to stay involved, to meet our goals and, and fulfill whatever we're trying to do as a lawyer, but also as a human, as a parent, in, in involvement with our communities. And I do think that this pandemic has kind of brought to the forefront the challenges and some of the problems that we are, we are going to face if law firms and practice settings are not more responsive and open to change and innovation that will allow people to stay involved in our profession that otherwise might not be. So not to sound too negative, I think there are opportunities as well, but I do think that is a huge challenge facing our profession going forward. Thank you. Same question, Judge Randon. Well, thank you for, for having me, first of all, and, and good afternoon to everyone. For me, uh, first of all, I'll echo everything Laura said, but one of the problems I see is attorney well-being, and in particular, mental well-being. I think one of the things that the pandemic has exacerbated is the, the pressures that lawyers face, particularly young lawyers, uh, adapting to the virtual setting, the fact that clients are stressed out, they may have lost family members, they may have loved ones that are ill or not well, they're under financial stress, and that stress is sort of uh, passed along to lawyers who don't have uh, sufficient outlets, I believe, and particularly in an environment where because of the pandemic, we're not getting together in group settings as much. So lawyers are isolated, they're stressed. I think it's really important and an issue that we need to be aware of going forward about uh, well-being and, and particularly mental well-being of lawyers and, and, and what we can do to sort of alleviate that. Okay, thank you for that. Same question to you, Chief Justice Head. Uh, yeah, and I, I agree with uh, everything the judge and Laura just said, um, and uh, and I'll emphasize what Laura said too, which is uh, don't take this too negative. I mean, we sound kind of sober here, um, but this is really an exciting time uh, to be joining the legal profession. And um, the, the, yeah, there's some there's there are issues ahead, um, and some of them are hard. Uh, but um, it, it's a, a great chance to make a contribution uh, to, as Justice Holmes said, live greatly in the law to, to really uh, find a, a lot of personal satisfaction. But, you, but you're going to have to work at it. Um, and there, there are going to be some challenges. And, and I just add to what they've said, which I uh, fully agree with. Um, as a profession, we're continuing um, to try to lower barriers to access, uh, especially for the very poor uh, and people with limited means. And, you know, we, we want the, the justice system uh, to be inclusive, absolutely. Nobody, nobody who serves the just, justice system like we do uh, wants to ever think that there are people that think it's unfair. We, we want to do everything we can to make sure not only that it is fair, but that people think it's fair. Um, and one, one aspect is if, if you're too poor to afford it when you need it, uh, that's bad. Uh, and it's a problem that we've struggled with for a long time in the United States. Uh, but there's a lot of um, uh, good uh, work that can be done on that and <laughs> a lot of satisfaction in it. And a lot that young lawyers can do in taking on pro bono cases and, and really helping uh, to improve access to justice. Okay, thank you for that. Um, this question is going to be for both Judge Randon and Attorney Farber. Long term, do you see new issues facing the profession? And if so, what are they? Oh, would you like me to take that? Sure. Yeah, I would say one of the things that young lawyers need to be aware of is 
you know, what's going to happen in the post-pandemic world? Um, one of the things we've talked about as a court is how much of what we do virtually now is going to carry over when we're finally on the other side of the pandemic. And for lawyers, I think they really need to start thinking about that and trying to figure out what their role is going to be in advocating for either more virtual hearings or fewer virtual hearings. And I'll give you an example. Uh, as a court, we've decided that things like status conferences, non-dispositive motions, things like that, um, we may continue to do virtually even after the pandemic is over because it saves the attorneys uh, the expense of actually coming to court just for a status conference or a non-dispositive motion. Uh, clients, if they have the minimum basis of technology or it's easier for them to participate, but there are real questions on the horizon of, well, what things um, should stay in the pre-pandemic world? Um, should we continue to do dispositive motions virtually? Um, should we continue to do mediations virtually? Should we continue to do trials virtually? And these are real questions that courts are pondering. And I think uh, young lawyers in particular have a role in uh, determining the course of uh, the practice. I personally am a strong advocate for more in-person hearings um, because I think, um, and, and we'll get into this, but one of the things that I think is, is lost in a virtual hearing is the formality uh, of the proceeding. And frankly, I think in some ways it's a less persuasive environment, but I encourage all the young lawyers to get involved in bar activities because one of the things we're gonna be talking about going forward is how much uh, of what we do is going to be virtual going forward. And so they really have an opportunity to shape the profession. Thank you for that, Judge Randon. Attorney Farber, same question. Thank you. Uh, obviously as an advocate, I have a similar, but maybe a little bit different perspective I do think that having a non-dispositive motions and status conferences virtually makes complete sense. And frankly, there were a lot of things, at least in my experience, that we could do uh, telephonically, maybe not by video, before the pandemic. What the pandemic did was it accelerated that approach that we needed to have because it was not safe to be in person in court, obviously. And, and so, but by doing that, We've now, we, we dipped our toe into the water, but now it's kind of a, it's a double-edged sword because yes, um, I do agree with the judge that, that you do lose some of that in-person persuasiveness or that connectivity and that advocacy. And in a trial, that to me, I think being in person is hugely important, especially for cross-examination of witnesses and you're trying to assess credibility and there's so many issues there. But Online mediation has been phenomenal from my perspective, especially if you have a client that's really far away and you know they, they don't have to travel. Um, the mediator can have virtual rooms. There's so many di different aspects to that, a virtual deposition. Um, there are different things that I think we need to open our minds to and be creative and willing to innovate. Doesn't mean it's always going to work, but I do think that we need to at least be considering different ways to participate. And, and frankly, I think we are going to be learning to live with this particular COVID-19. I don't think it's ever gonna be completely gone. Uh, obviously, hopefully a pandemic state of things will be gone. But I do think that this has been an opportunity to allow us to do things differently and we'll talk about this later also in terms of hybrid and remote work and things of that nature. But I do think that there will be some opportunities for innovation that we should be open to and at least try. You know, and if they don't work, uh, we get that. But making it an offering versus making it mandatory, that's another thing that I certainly want us to consider. And we're gonna be focusing on that in the ABA House of Delegates, hopefully uh, with a resolution um, along the lines of what Judge Random was talking about, which is on civil cases, non-dispositive matters, and um, status conferences of that nature, urging courts to at least offer the opportunity for lawyers and you know, proper and other litigants to participate in that manner. 
Okay, thank you, Attorney Farber. Uh, so this question is going to be for all of our faculty. How do you believe the COVID-19 pandemic has changed the judicial system or legal profession? Is it positively, negatively? What are your thoughts? I'll start with Chief Justice Heck. Well, uh, turn it upside down. So uh, <laughs> March 13, 2020, uh, a state of disaster was declared in the country and uh, most states, including Texas. And um, March 16 on Monday, uh, every court in Texas was shut down because uh, we didn't know what to do. We didn't know. Uh, and uh, we didn't know if staff could get there safely. You know, we were just all looking. Well, it's a year and a half since then, and we've dealt with a lot of issues. Um, but I, th I hope, <laughs> I, uh, people say, uh, you know, never let a good crisis go to waste. Uh, and I would say, never let a good pandemic or bad pandemic go to waste. But I hope that what we're going to be forced to do is look at um, the way we've done things just kind of without thinking too much about it. Um, I, I take Judge Rannon's point, um, but in 2019, we decided 8.9 million cases in Texas. Uh, and about uh, seven and a half million of those were very low level offenses, very simple civil cases, uh, things that could have been done at much less expense. Uh, and, um, and we're kind of getting an idea Hey, you know, this could be good for that. We could do, we could do a lot better. Um, and I, I think as you as young lawyers, as, as you're interfacing with that and seeing how the courts are themselves sort of working through this, because this is happening to every court in the country, state and federal. I mean, we're all looking at um, what does this mean going forward? And you're going to be on the cutting edge of that. You're going to be helping to have input uh, with your firms or in your practice. Uh, let's do it this way. Let's think about that way. Uh, uh, so I think the, the, a lot of changes in the offing. Technology is the big one. Um, but um, just um, trimming down, making it easier uh, for people to use the justice system. I, 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 we're, we're being forced to look at that. Okay, thank you. Judge Randon. I think. Um, in many ways, the, the pandemic has um, made it easier for people to start their own practice. I think, if I think back to 1992, when I was getting out of law school, um, the overhead associated with starting your own practice was overwhelming. Uh, the pandemic has hastened the technological changes needed to sort of make it inexpensive or less expensive uh, to have your own practice. What lawyers have realized is maybe we don't need uh, a brick and mortar, especially for a small practice or solo practice, mm -hmm. a brick and mortar office. We can, there, there are places that you can meet if you need to meet in person uh, at a, re a remote office, um, but it's just made it easier. The technology has made it easier for uh, young lawyers to be in multiple places. Um, to practice in multiple areas because it's virtual. Um, so, so there have been benefits. I mean, the, the negative for me is, um, and in particularly for a young lawyer is, being in court, hearing other arguments, getting to rub shoulders with more experienced lawyers, getting to interact with other practitioners, that really helps the growth of a young lawyer. And to a certain extent, I suppose that's been lost. It's one of the big downsides as well as um, I think there's something to be said of, of coming to court. Um, and, and I think um, going through the process of even going through security, seeing the judge, the, the, the formal nature of the proceedings, it's kind of lost uh, in a virtual setting. And I think that's why, um, for example, I've had experiences of people, uh, attorneys, appearing in their cars to do to represent clients and 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 wearing sort of 
clothing that you wouldn't see if it were if they were in person hearings. So there's been a little loss of formality, but I think overall the technology has opened up a lot of opportunities for young lawyers to sort of hang their own shingle uh, and 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 you know build a career that way. Okay, thank you for that, Attorney Farwer. Yes, I would say that in terms of the positive. I do think that having the opportunity to take a stigma away from the idea of remote work, for example. There are a lot of people that have been doing what, what I know I have been doing, which is working remotely and having the equipment. I have a scanner printer. I have you know all my equipment set up in my home office. I didn't know I could even have a home office, but to have that considered to be okay and you know, not lesser of a commitment to my job, to my profession. I think that a lot of people have opened their minds to that opportunity, uh, but with it comes negatives. For example, navigating, drawing those boundaries when you are in a home office between childcare responsibilities or making sure that attorney client conversation is not overheard. Um, you know, you've got confidentiality concerns and ethics concerns, but then when it comes to interacting with the judiciary to Judge Randon's point, you know, making sure that you preserve that formality. It's a privilege to be able to zoom in or to um, use some other platform, depending on your court, that they have for a virtual appearance. But you better make sure that that appearance is as close to an in-person as possible, at least from attorney's perspective. And it's very disappointing to hear that some don't take that as formally. My gosh, if I ever took an appearance from a car, I, I just can't even imagine. I mean, that's just I don't think that's the way to go. And I would never advise anyone to do anything like that in any scenario. And so I do think that having the privilege, you need to respect it. And so you need to make sure that you, know, you are treating things with that formality. On the negative side, the mentorship is definitely a big, big challenge, especially for new and young lawyers, because having it in person, whether you're actually appearing in court or you're dealing with opposing counsel, you know, in a deposition setting or in, or in a mediation or whatever it happens to be, I do think that having an opportunity to see how other lawyers do it and, and being there in person, interacting with clients, opposing counsel, the court, that is different and may, and it's not completely lost. It's on a different platform many times, but it is very, very different. And so I think that can be quite a challenge and to develop those skills to, to become that advocate you know, it, it's just, it's very, very different. I do think that the hybrid approach is hopefully one that we will continue to see into the future. And, and you know, that that will kind of bring our roads together. Uh, some of the things we've experimented on will become things that we can actually do uh, depending on circumstances. So I do think there have been positive and negative influences, but I do think that we're gonna come out of this for the better. Thank you, Attorney Farber. Okay, uh, for our next question. This is going to be for Chief Justice Heck and Attorney Farber. From the public's perspective, has COVID-19 made access to justice easier or more difficult? What are your thoughts? I'm gonna start with Chief Justice. Oh, um, well, uh, both. Um, so when we first started out, um, the, uh, it was harder, it was a lot harder because um, we, you know, legal aid uh, kind of operates like other uh, legal practices. They're used to going to the courthouse and um, uh, handling cases. And uh, that, that's kind of the, you know, a lot of what they do. Now, of course, legal aid does a lot of uh, negotiation and um, it's not all court work, uh, in fact, uh, that's not even a, a big part of it, but it, but it, there is a lot of it. Uh, so it was harder. And of course the travail, the personal travail that went along with the pandemic, uh, people not being able to pay rent, losing their jobs, not being able to get health care, um, schools being closed, daycare centers being closed, all those kinds of things contributed to um, a lot of uh, increased extremity uh, that uh, legal aid providers uh, access to justice had to deal with. Um, but um, in a lot of places, um, 
the, uh, they got money for that. Um, in Texas, we got a lot of federal funding from the COVID uh, relief programs uh, that went to legal aid providers. Uh, and I know that happened around the country in, differently in different places. Um, but they're all doing the same. Uh, the legal aid providers, access to justice folks are all doing the same thing we're doing as we're sitting here on this program. They're all thinking about, okay, now going forward, how do I make it easier for my client uh, to confer with me, um, to uh, go through papers with me, to get ready for a court appearance? Uh, how do I make sure they have the access to technology? Because uh, there's a real digital divide in the country. And uh, this, you know, this just laid that bare. Uh, when we said, well, I'll, you know, thank goodness you can get there uh, remotely. Well, that's not true for a lot of people. Uh, and um, it's, uh, <laughs> you know, and if anything, you move the courthouse further away. Um, but, but that's an opportunity to, to work on that. I, I know, for example, there's been a lot of work um, that just started during the pandemic um, on how can we have some sort of national Wi-Fi access that uh, would really uh, remove the digital divide. So, um, so that's that's not going to happen tomorrow. But uh, but at least we're it, it it exposed the issue, and now we can work on it and try to make it uh, uh, try to make it better because we want to come out of this uh, on the back end, uh, having learned some things and tried to make it better. Thank you, Justice Heck. Attorney Farber, same question. Yes, I think Justice Heck po points out some really important issues. That digital divide is an issue, especially in rural areas uh, where that Wi-Fi signal doesn't exist and you can have all the wonderful gadgets if you're able to even have those gadgets and it won't matter if you can't get good Wi-Fi and internet signal. And if you have access to the gadgets, for example, at a public library or a law library, you know, making sure that every opportunity is there to give people, whether they have the gadgets, I call them gadgets, you know, the, the computer and all the ways to connect and have the Wi-Fi is, is really an issue. And to the extent that we can focus on that, to the extent that we can, you know, bridge that divide, I think the access issue goes hand in hand with that on the digital front and, and the way that we virtually have, have made this happen. Uh, but there's, there's a bunch of people in between, the ones that don't have and the ones that have, and those, you know, the working poor, I, I worry about, about that group as well, who may not qualify for legal aid, um, but yet don't have enough to, you know, to have access on the other end, and how, how is that being perceived, and whether that's a good thing in terms of the virtual ability to participate, and the continued, you know, they still have the waiver of fees if you qualify to, you know, to have a virtual hearing, but even having to do that or knowing how to do that, you know, there are concerns. So I do think that this has uh, presented an opportunity for courts and justice systems throughout the country. And I'm really hopeful that it will become a priority so that we can address the ongoing need. And of course, you know, there's always what the ABA does and we do it and we're proud of it is the continued lobbying for uh, legal services corporation funding and that's on the legal aid side and we need to make sure that we continue to fund and also consider funding the national wi-fi efforts and digital efforts so that more people can reach and, and and have access to the courts even if it doesn't mean in-person physical presence so i think we're on the same page in that regard and i'm optimistic that that will eventually uh, happen over time in some fashion thank you attorney farber uh, this next question is for Chief Justice Heck. What changes or trends have you seen occur over time within the legal profession? And based on those trends, what role do you believe technology will play in the future of law practice? Well, uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> when I when I started practice, we we uh, were trying to figure out how to use word processors. So I, you know, I won't tell how old I am, but you know, it, it's not like I'm fooling anybody. So uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, the, big the two big changes I think um, are that of technology. 
So, you know, email started uh, through the legal community in the early 90s. Uh, now it's the way we all talk. Um, and we couldn't practice without it. Uh, so, uh, and it's, it's getting more sophisticated. So what does that mean to you? You need to know how to do it. Uh, when we first uh, got into the pandemic, the National Center for State Courts put on a number of webinars for state judges and state court uh, clerks and personnel. This is how you Zoom. This is what you click on. This is the button you press. This is how you keep people out of it. This is, you know, just taking them through step by step because they never heard of it, you know. And so you got to, and most of us are not going to go learn it by ourselves, but you, but you need to. You need to understand how it works, how to be adept at it. Um, when you are doing remote proceedings, uh, for example, in our court, we, we've had uh, oral argument remote through all of last term, and we're back in person now, but uh, you need to have your podium set up. You need to know where the camera is. You need to know where to look. You need to make sure your signal's strong. Uh, or get somebody to help you with that because um, that's uh, what you, uh, uh, that's the thing. And then the other big change, and we all know this, is that law has become a business. Um, and um, years ago, it was, uh, that was not so pronounced an effect in the legal profession. I, I mean, there was still a, a pretty strong idea that this was uh, like medicine and other professions. Uh, it was more of a calling and you went in, you weren't always looking at the bottom line, although you got to look at the bottom line. Uh, now uh, we've transitioned where there's a lot of bottom line looking. Uh, and uh, that creates a whole lot of stresses, um, like Judge Rannon mentioned, uh, wellness issues, because if you're worried about whether you're making it and you know you're gonna make partner you're gonna how much of your billing is gonna be all these kinds of issues um that's a lot of stress but um despite those pressures there's still room to find um professional uh, satisfaction uh and uh to stay healthy and to uh have time for families and outside lives and but you just you know, that's probably not going to be handed to you. You're probably going to have to go look for that and, uh, and make it work. Um, but uh, I would say those are the two uh, big changes. Uh, a lot of lawyers, a lot of young lawyers, my law clerks, they get out and they go to big firms to practice. And their big complaint is we don't get to do anything meaningful. We're looking at documents. We're doing this. We're doing that. It's not, not what I went to law school for. Um, but they're just, you just have to find other ways of doing that through clinics and uh, pro bono work and uh, other ways of, um, there's a lot of legal need out there and, uh, and there's a lot of way to, to find satisfaction, I think. Okay, thank you, Justice Heck. Okay, the next question is going to be for everyone. What advice or tips would you give to new lawyers on how to best advocate on behalf of their clients in a virtual court setting, what are some of the do's and don'ts? I'm gonna start with Judge Randon because you seem as though you've had some good experiences. I have. I, uh, the first thing that I would really encourage young lawyers in particular to do is work on their written communication. It's so important and even more so, I think in a virtual hearing, um, I always remain open-minded as judges should, and I love to engage with lawyers uh, in oral argument. But I think the virtual setting is one is in which um, it's a little harder to be persuasive. And that lends itself to being um, necessary to file more thorough briefs um, and to communicate in a way that's direct and straightforward. I'm a big advocate of, of plain English for lawyers, um, but I think in particular in a virtual environment where it may be uh, somewhat more of a challenge to be persuasive, um, 
that your written work um, needs to be that much, you need to be that much more exacting and precise and persuasive with your written work. The other thing, and, and we've touched on this before, is, is the formality. Um, I do recommend that if you're in a hearing, make sure you're at a, a desk. Uh, make sure that you're dressed appropriately. Uh, make sure that you treat it just as you would um, uh, an in-person court hearing. And as easy as that sounds, I think um, the technology, because it has multiple uses, I mean, for example, people have Zoom birthday parties. Okay, they have, they do a lot of social things on Zoom. And it's started out, um, well, not started out, but it has a casual component to it because it can be used for getting together, for connecting with friends. Um, and sometimes um, that sort of casualness carries over into a formal court hearing. And, and some of the reasons why we do the things that we do in court, why we say, all rise. It's not for the, for the judge. It's to recognize the formality and the seriousness of what's taking place. Um, so yeah, treat the hearing as though it was an in-person hearing in, in every respect, but be a little more exacting, a little more direct, and a little more persuasive and thorough in your written work because I think that's going to hold an even greater weight in a, in a sort of virtual setting. Okay, thank you, Judge Randon. Chief Justice Heck? Uh, yeah, I agree with that. And then just don't let the uh, technology be a distraction. Uh, you know, practice out ahead of time. Make sure you got it down. Uh, figure out where you're going to stand. If you were going into a courtroom, you wouldn't be standing there fiddling with your briefcase or trying to find what papers you were supposed to be looking at, or you'd have it down. You, you'd be ready to pull it out, lay it down and start. Uh, and you just need to make sure you do that ahead of time and that you practice it uh, so that it's, it's perfect. Uh, and um, when it first started out, there was a lot of fumbling around, but now a lot of lawyers are getting pretty adept at this. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, you know, it's kind of Perry Mason like <laughs> they're kind of they they're getting the hang of it. So uh, I, uh, don't let it be a distraction. OK, thank you, Attorney Farber. Well, I agree with everything the judge and the justice have said. Prepare, 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 mm -hmm. just like you would if you were going in in person hearing. You have to be prepared. And judges know when you're not prepared, they can tell right away. And when I say prepare, I mean, substantively, you know, whatever you're arguing, make sure that you're, you know, you've reviewed your written work, you're not repeating the arguments in your written work. A lot of judges don't want necessarily to, to repeat everything that you've written. They want to hear what, you know, what you're going to say persuasively. So be ready for that. Check your technology. I, I have a little anecdote. I, of course, checked everything ahead of time, had been working on this platform. And for whatever reason, on the morning of my hearing, and I logged in timely, I could not get in. I could not get in for the life of me. So my assistant was helping. I was calling the court. I was trying to figure out what to do. Fortunately, I was able to get in my hearing with a co-counsel. I had a co-counsel in the case who was able to, to get me in. Um, I wasn't able to virtually, physically, you know, video appear, but I had the telephonic appearance. And it just goes to show that you can be super prepared and things might happen on the technology. So be nimble, be ready to come up with a plan B and even think about that plan B ahead of time if plan A doesn't work. Um, more, most importantly, be respectful of the court's time, be way on time, be ahead of time, dress the part as if you were in court in person. I mean, really that's the message coming out of this. Treat this as if you were making an in-person appearance in every respect. And even on your screensaver, if they're going to see your screensaver on your video, make sure it's an appropriate image. If it's going to be an image or if not, it's just your name. You, you know, you to the point that I think Justice Heck made the informality sometimes of, of, you know, how we use these platforms 
don't let that cross over into your professional advocacy and your professional setting. So all of that matters. All of that is important. Your reputation matters. The authenticity of what you're arguing in court, always remember those points. But really, I think it comes down to treating this as you would treat any other matter with preparation. Thank you, Attorney Farber. This next question is for Judge Randon. What are some things that new lawyers can do to stay nimble during this time of great transition within the profession? Well, I think this is an area where new lawyers are gonna excel because um, unlike some of us more seasoned lawyers, you guys are really adept and proficient at using the technology. But even as an old head, I think one of the things you can do to stay nimble is really um, check your sort of technological hardware. I think now's a good time to make sure you've got maybe even a business level type internet speed. Um, the other thing that I think has happened because of the, um, a lot of the virtual hearings is clients expect to be more updated on what's happening in their case. So you may want to get, I know a lot of lawyers now have gone to client portals where a client can go online, find out the status of their case, they can get updated on what's happening in their case. That's a technology uh, that may be useful. But I think um, what a good, a good use of the time is to make sure you have the, the latest technology, which, which, um, which young lawyers tend to be better at than more seasoned lawyers. Um, make sure that you have that in place. And then um, the, the, the other bit of advice I would do is, is research technology. Um, because I'm a, a judge, we have the free use of Westlaw. I'm not sure how much it costs now, but there are many inexpensive ways of doing thorough research where you're able to get uh, the most up-to-date case on a particular issue. Um, so make sure you have not only the hardware, the, 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 the necessary broadband, um, but also make sure you have the, the latest uh, research tools that are, that are available to you. Thank you. Next question is for Attorney Farber. Without person-to-person -person interaction, networking has taken a bit of a hit. For younger lawyers trying to establish themselves in the profession, what are some tips they can use to substitute for that face-to-face -face interaction? Well, I would say it's really the same as you're in person in the sense that you are still going to be looking for opportunities to connect with people and connect with them on a variety of different levels. First of all, you know, what area are you practicing in? Uh, your local bar association, your state bar association, the ABA, of course, provide plenty of opportunities to get involved and to network in ways that I think are helpful and helpful in terms of honing your skills and there are so many programs, so many opportunities that are virtual. You just need to explore them. And, you know, writing, publishing, speaking, like we're doing now, even on a virtual format, to the extent you can, those are opportunities to network, to share what you are good at with the world and that people will notice. And we don't do that for any specific reason. I don't get involved with the ABA and haven't been for quite a long time. Uh, for networking purposes, but it has resulted in business for me. And I do think that if you are good at what you do and you're passionate about something, whatever that something happens to be, it comes through. And in addition to the legal profession, think about trade organizations, think about ways to participate virtually in things that you might not otherwise have done in person, opportunities to do that are there, whether it's a women lawyers affinity group or one that's based on ethnic or racial diversity, or one that's based on you love animals, so you, you know, getting involved with the Humane Society, look at, look at opportunities for that kind of involvement. And it doesn't all have to be in person. You can also network with firm, you know, other lawyers, if you're in a big firm setting, you know, setting aside opportunities to connect virtually and maybe make sure you know, if there are client opportunities to get in front of different clients, 
you know, making yourself available. There's so many different ways to do this and to do it in a way that's effective. Most of these opportunities that I've been seeing don't even cost very much, if anything, um, to be involved virtually. The key is that you need to be looking at what's out there, what offerings exist in either my community locally or nationally. What's great about doing this on a Zoom basis or a technology basis is you don't have to travel to network. You can network all over the place beyond your immediate geography because of the technology. So that in and of itself presents all kinds of wonderful opportunities. So really it's just the checklist. Uh, the, the stuff that I'm involved in in my profession, the things in the trade organization and the other outside things that you might want to engage in, whatever those happen to be that you can make connections with. And you never know, usually over time, having had those conversations, it turns into wonderful opportunities, whether they, whether they are new matters, new clients, or opportunities for your own personal fulfillment. That's the approach that I would take. And it's no different than in person, other than there are more opportunities because of the technology. Okay, thank you, Attorney Farber. Um, this next question will be for Judge Randon and Chief Justice Heck. Uh, Judge Randon, I'll start with you. Please give some examples of innovative technology that has been used within your jurisdiction and briefly describe why it was put into place. Well, one of the things that we've done uh, and, and we've had in place for a long time is we have had the ability Obviously we have an electronic docket, but any docket um, where there's been a motion or hearing, uh, you have the ability to click on that docket and actually hear the argument in the dispositive motion, or in fact, any motion. Um, it's a technology that we've had in place for a long time, but I think it's very, very useful, particularly for young lawyers, uh, because it's an opportunity to one, uh, hear other lawyers argue, Two, get a sense for the types of questions that I might ask counsel, um, the length of the arguments, uh, the, the way to uh, sort of best practices from, from other lawyers. So I think that's one technology that, that we've had in place for years that has sort of been underutilized. Um, in fact, many of the practitioners in our district still don't realize uh, that we, we, we have the ability uh, to hear any hearing that's been conducted. And I think we go back seven years. So I think that's something that young lawyers should explore because I think uh, there may be a few courts, particularly federal courts that have the ability for you to listen in to previous arguments. For example, if there's a motion for summary judgment in a case that uh, a court decided that may be helpful to your client, for you to go back and listen to that argument uh, could be quite helpful in preparing uh, to, to argue before a particular judge. That's great. Chief Justice Heck, same question. Yeah, and I just, I'd say the same thing. And when I was a trial judge, um, the, uh, you know, a lawyer who was going to appear in court and wasn't down there all the time would come by and maybe sit in the back and watch a uh, motion docket or something to see how, to kind of see how it went. Or, they would come by and ask the bailiff or the clerk. Now, you know, how does the judge do this? How does the judge do that? Um, so that when you showed up on your item, uh, you could act like, uh, you know, I've been I've been here before, uh, because you knew you had a pretty good expectation of what's going to happen. Um, and you know, if you were practicing locally, you could do that. If you're practicing uh, in a if you're in a court a long way away, that would be harder to do. Um, I remember years ago on the Supreme Court of Texas, uh, we had a nationally prominent lawyer who was arguing a big case for that he thought was a big case, and it was, um, in our court, and he'd never been in our court before. And we did not, we didn't have what Judge Brandon just now said. We do now but we didn't have any way of monitoring or looking in or watching a, a YouTube or anything like that. And he came down two days ahead of time uh, to walk around the building, figure out where to park, figure out how to get in, uh, sit there, watch the proceeding and see who asked questions, how it went, um, so that, that none of those things would be an issue for him 
when he got up to argue his case. Um, and nowadays, uh, all you have to do is push a button and uh, it, it, uh, it's just exactly like the judge said, you, you can watch proceedings, you can watch ongoing proceedings. If you're like, if you're doing a pro bono case and it's family and you don't do much family, uh, uh, you can go to a family court that's handling all these remotely, dial in, watch it, uh, see how the judge conducts it, see where the kids sit, see where the spouses sit, you know, and, and it really does help. That's really been, been a, been a uh, big change. Thank you. And this is the last question um, before we maybe take a few questions from the um, audience. And it's for everyone. Are there any particular resources that you can point new, excuse me, new attorneys to that would be helpful with conducting depositions, mediations, witness via video, et cetera? And I will start with Chief Justice Heck. Uh, well, the, uh, usually your local bar has stuff like that. Uh, the state bar has uh, stuff like that. There are all kinds of professional um, things made available. The ABA does it. Um, in, uh, in various aspects of state court uh, operations, uh, the National Center for State Courts uh, has a lot of materials on, for example, like evictions. How do you you know, how do you, if you're, how do you handle an eviction in Idaho? Well, uh, they've got a paper on that and you can go look and see, you know, th to do it. Um, so uh, there's a lot of, a lot of resources uh, that, uh, that, that are available. Thank you. Judge Randon. Yeah, I'd echo, um... What the, what, what the chief uh, justice said. I mean, uh, one of the things that we have here in Michigan is there are various, and, and I'm sure it's the case in every state, but there are various practice groups that you can join uh, when you sign up for your annual membership. And it's through those practice groups that you can sort of get um, specific tips on, for example, there may be a litigation practice groups. Um, that will that will provide uh, instruction, courses, um, manuals, videos uh, to get specific directions on on how to properly do a deposition, uh, how to properly draft a complaint, how to properly answer a complaint, what's to be expected at a Rule Twenty Six hearing, how to conduct a, a, an argument before the state supreme court. The bar is set up in practice groups. And I think it's really important for young lawyers to get involved in a practice group, whatever their specialty is. If they wanna be in bankruptcy, then they should join uh, the bankruptcy specialty group. And there is the best place to get, I think, specific direct ideas and tips on how to best do things that occur within that particular practice group. Okay, thank you, Judge Randon. And Attorney Farber, same question. Thank you. Um, I would say that you really need to do your homework, especially when it comes to, for example, virtual depositions. I have taken some where I just got so frustrated and then others where I said, okay, this is, this is what I'm sticking with. Let me give you an example. And I, I'm not trying to advertise for anyone when I say this, but there's a, a, there's a program called Steno that allows you to preload documents for a deposition on your side and then release them. You press a button and it releases the download and you can highlight, it's really user-friendly. I love this platform. And I, I mean, I'm not trying to advocate for one but you need to find one that works for you. But that is a platform that allows you to take a virtual deposition with documents that's manageable where you have disclosure to opposing counsel for the documents, your, your court reporter has access to them. You need to look for those kind of resources. A court reporter that has familiarity with a program that allows you to use documents to ask a witness questions in a virtual setting. I think it is really, really helpful to explore those kind of scenarios that make the process easier and effective. And there are plenty of resources out there. I just gave you one example, but there are plenty out there that can work for you. 
The key is to experiment and to practice with them before you take that deposition to make sure that this is going to work. Mediation, I think online, most mediators have the platform set up for you, but it's important for you to manage your expectations with your clients of what this is going to look like. These virtual breakout rooms that they've set up for most mediations can be very effective, especially if you wanna have conversations separate and, and you know, or with the mediator. The mediator can also pull out the attorneys and have a separate, I was put into a kitchen, a virtual kitchen with the other opposing counsel, you know, to have a conversation about a mediation. There are so many different wonderful tools now that exist that allow you to participate. But the key is to educate yourself ahead of time, to experiment ahead of time with whatever you're going to try so that you feel comfortable and you can use it effectively. Um, there's training modules, especially with programs like the one I mentioned and others that you can uh, practice with. And then to prepare your clients for whatever the process is going to be ahead of time. So they know what to expect. They know how to navigate, um, how it's going to work. You know, obviously in in-person mediation, we used to sit around all day and, you know, maybe we take a break for lunch. You know, it's very, very different. In a virtual setting, it's going to be different, but it's also an opportunity to really spend some time with your client when the mediator is talking to the other party. So take advantage of those opportunities virtually as well, because they are they can be very, very meaningful. So those are some of the some of the ideas. And yes, I echo what both a chief justice and a judge said about resources. Um, definitely uh, explore those at your local, your state bar, and the ABA because there are plenty of them. Thank you. So I appreciate the information you've shared with us today. Um, we have a little bit of time left, so I guess I will um, take maybe one of the questions from the um, audience, and this will be for Judge Randon and Chief Justice Heck. Um, I'll start with Judge Randon. What types of experiences should someone have if they're interested in pursuing a judicial appointment? Well, if you're interested in pursuing a ju judicial appointment, one of the first things I would suggest is, you know, be the best lawyer that you can be. Okay. Secondly, um, obtaining trial experience, particularly for a young lawyer, uh, can be a challenge. But one of the best ways, what I did since I was at a firm, and wasn't really getting in a lot of trial practice. I did a lot of pro bono cases. It's a way to serve the underserved, and it's a way it helps you because it helps you build um, a reputation of being able to hand, handle trials. You can start off with small stuff. So I started out doing landlord tenant cases pro bono to get in court, misdemeanor criminal cases. And then I second chaired a uh, a felony case and so on. And that's the way I built a sort of a basis of trial experience. The other thing um, that these committees are interested in is scholarship. And so it's important to, I think, to pick an interest of uh, an area of law that you're particularly interested in, write on it. Um, and lastly, the last piece of advice I would say is many of the people that serve on these judicial selection committees are active in the bar. So one way you can meet, and it's a relationship business. Uh, so one way you can meet these people is to be active in the bar. Pursue your passion in the law and get active in it. And what you'll find is you'll meet people that when you appear before them for an interview for a judicial appointment, they'll know you, they'll know your work, and they'll be able to advocate for you in front of other committee members. Hey, thank you, Chief Justice Heck, same question. Yeah, it's, uh, basically the same answer. Uh, you, you know, we uh, choose judges a lot of different ways in the country. Um, and I, I don't mean this facetiously, but you should get to know the chooser uh, because, uh, uh, you know, maybe it's the president of the United States, so you're probably not going to get very close to him or her. But um, if it's a senator or a congressman that's going to make a recommendation on a federal appointment, in Texas, we have a, a committee that makes recommendations to the senators on Article Three uh, appointees, and so you would, you know, you would, you would want to be somebody who, when your name came up, they would people around the table would say, "Oh yeah, I, I ran," or you know, "I heard about that," or this or that. 
uh, in um, most of the states, uh, judges are elected one way or the other. Uh, and so you just need to be familiar with that process. Um, and I, I would urge you to stay out of the politics of it. Uh, but uh, but sometimes it is sort of political. And uh, but again, it uh, that and then being active in the bar, being active in in something serving the community, um, so that uh, you look like you're a broader person than just the just being a really smart lawyer. Um, and, uh, you know, there are lots of, re lots of reasons the pickers pick who they do. Um, but I, I think the biggest reason most of the time, and there are a million exceptions to this, but, uh, the biggest reason the most of the time is, is that you want a really good person to be there. You want somebody that's going to work hard, be fair, not, um, uh, be very temperate, be patient, and going to make the good decisions, have a lot of common sense. And that's just a kind of a background that you can work on in the bar, in the community, uh, again, so that uh, when somebody's looking around for a judge, they say, oh, it should be John or Mary over there that, you know, they'd be a natural. Thank you, Chief Justice Heck. Uh, at this time, we're going to conclude. I'd like to personally thank Judge Randon, Chief Justice Heck, Attorney Farber for coming and speaking to us and sharing your experiences. Um, you all have a great service-minded attitude and you continue to pour into young lawyers. Uh, so it's very much appreciated. I'd also like to thank Coleman Potts, the current vice chair of the uh, Lawyers Conference of the Judicial um, Division who helps with planning the program. And I'd like to thank those in attendance. Uh, I wish you all a good day. Thank you so much. Yep, thank you.